so th uh, this is a very basic uh, form of the ATR signaling pathway that we uh, have been studying for quite some time uh, and summarizes many people's data. Uh, just to indicate that the single-stranded DNA that forms at stalled replication forks is critical to recruit multiple proteins, including the atr atrip complex through this interaction of RPA and atrip, as well as this 911 complex that stabilizes top BP1. And that protein is a direct activator. Bill Dumpy's lab discovered that a few years ago. It's a direct activator of the ATR kinase by um, binding ATR and the ATRIP protein and stimulating its kinase activity towards substrates, including things like CHECK1. Of course, there's many other proteins involved in, these, uh, in this pathway uh, that uh, I'm just going to skip over at this point. But we've been interested in how this uh, pathway works and what it does to stabilize replication forks and control cell cycle uh, and DNA repair. And one of the things that uh, we tried to do, actually, um, a few years ago, in, in part motivated by the same reason that Tony was interested in making a site-specific lesion, was uh, develop a method to look at the proteins at stalled replication forks, and in this case, in human cells. And uh, a student, Bianca Sirbu, developed this method, IPOND, which most of you, I think, are uh, are aware of, and it's a very nice method to purify proteins that are enriched near replication forks on the nascent DNA. I will point out that it has some limitations. Uh, you have to use short pulse times, otherwise you might as well just do chromatin uh, uh, fractionation, and you should also be doing things like pulse chases uh, to really understand where your proteins are. And finally, it's also a, an ensemble method. So all we see is an average event of what might be going on. We can't look at uh, any single event. But using this method, uh, we've made some discoveries. And in part, uh, what I'm going to tell you about is discoveries made possible by Huzefa Dungrawala, who is a postdoc who combined IPOND with uh, SILAC-based mass spectrometry. And so this is just a method to look quantitatively at how much uh, a protein uh, might be at, at, uh, in one condition at a fork versus another. So for example, in a hydroxyurea-treated stalled uh, situation versus a normal situation, one can see that the ATR kinase is more enriched at the stalled fork than at the normal fork. And you can see that uh, just the ratio by the SILAC method. And uh, so Josefa published uh, a paper last year, and I'm just going to summarize a, a few of the conclusions from that paper and then move on to unpublished data. So what we typically are observing and quantitating are about 220 proteins that are enriched near replication forks. That includes all the replisome proteins that we know of, as well as many proteins involved in chromatin replication, chromatin maturation, et cetera. And another, uh, well, uh, approximately 80 proteins become enriched at the replication fork in response to agents like hydroxyurea. We also noted that, at least in the cells that we've been examining, the fork continues to move in hydroxyurea, in even three or four millimolar hydroxyurea, and we've calculated a rate of movement. But what this means is that uh, during a long uh, experiment, if one does uh, hour-long time points, in fact, the replication forks are converging and terminating in a normal way. So in some ways, we see replisome dissociation during hydroxyurea treatment uh, uh, conditions over a long time course, but that largely reflects the normal termination events as, replica as replicons are completed and no re new replicons are started because the ATR kinase is active and stops origin firing. Uh, an exception to that is PCNA and associated proteins, and, and those proteins actually undergo a biphasic loss from replication forks, and I, I'd be happy to explain what, what we think is happening, but largely it's, it's a, the, the first phase is very quick, probably because of a change in equilibrium of the unloading and loading of PCNA at forks. And finally, uh, similar to what Kareem Labib's lab had shown in, in yeast, we didn't see any evidence that the ATR kinase activity uh, is required to stabilize the replisome itself, although, of course, it's required to stabilize the fork. So we see a, a, abundance of double-strand breaks, double-strand break repair proteins, and excess single-stranded DNA when ATR is inhibited. So because mass spectrometry is an unbiased method, we also observe many proteins in the data set that we've never studied before or haven't been observed before. Uh, one of those I'm going to tell you about today is this ETAA1 protein. And it behaves very similar to the, uh, the canonical replication stress response proteins, things like RPA, ATR, the Bloom protein, et cetera. All of these proteins become enriched at the fork in response to stalling. And ETAA1 is, is, is very similar. 
So there's not much known about this protein. It's also called ETAA16 for Ewing's tumor-associated antigen. It doesn't tell you very much. There is uh, a couple papers now uh, that show that, a, uh, that the ETA1 locus is actually um, a polymorphism in that locus may be associated with an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. So that's about all we knew, knew when we started this project. So the ETA1 protein didn't give us much um, insight into the sequence, didn't give us much insight into what it might be doing. It's 100 kilodaltons, and largely when you blast search it, it it's conserved invertebrates, but really no known domain structure. Now, we hypothesized it might be interacting with RPA based on how it behaved in the IPON data sets. And in fact, that's true. There are two RPA interacting motifs in this protein. The, the strongest one is actually at the C terminus that interacts with this domain of RPA32, so winged helix domain. And actually, this is NMR spectroscopy data showing that the ETA1 peptide that looks a lot like the SMARTAL1 peptide, TIPIN, XPA, all these proteins have this motif that bind in the same way to the RPA32C domain. There's a second motif in this protein that binds RPA as well, and that's an RPA70N binding motif, and that's the sequence of that motif in ETA1. And it looks a lot like ATRIP, MR11, and RAD9, and P53, which all share this similar motif that's capable of binding the 70N domain. Now, the, those interactions are what brings ETA1 to stalled replication forks. One observes very beautiful foci of this protein when it's uh, uh, expressed in cells that are treated with DNA damaging agents that co-localize with RPA. If we delete just the C-terminal uh, RPA32 interacting motif, you see we lose a lot of that localization, although there's still a little bit left underneath there. If we delete the 70N binding motif, we really see no difference. But if we delete both motifs in the same protein, now we completely abrogate the ability of ETA1 to localize to stalled replication forks. And this is just co-IP data showing, again, the, the interaction of the full-length protein. And then the, the two uh, binding motifs mutated largely uh, eliminate that interaction. So um, it's at stalled forks. What's it doing? Is it important? Well, if one knocks down ETA1, we see uh, a mild change in the cell cycle, uh, just a small increase in S and G2 phase cells. But if we treat the cells with replication stress agents, things like captathecin, camptathecin, we see dramatic effects. For example, this is a control um, cell culture population treated with CPT for 24 hours and then released. And you see the cells will continue, uh, finish replication in about 14 hours after that challenge. The ETA1 deficient cells are obviously defective in that restart event. And in fact, they are going to be destined to die. We see uh, in this, uh, in three different clones of a CRISPR-Cas9 knockout uh, situation, we see uh, high sensitivity to the camptothecin uh, across a very large dose response range. We also observed uh, defects in uh, replication actually in unperturbed uh, situations, and those include appearance of gamma H2X foci and appearance of double strand breaks by comet assay. So this is an untreated population, just knocked down ETA1, and there's a slight increase in gamma H2X. This is specific to the cells that are in S or G2 phases. That difference is actually exacerbated if uh, you treat with things like hydroxyurea or CPT. You can see a, a dramatic difference in the, in the deficient cells. And here, the neutral comet assay shows appearance of double strand breaks after ETA1 knockdown, and then again exacerbated in cells treated with CPT. We also see evidence of excess single stranded DNA in these cells. Again, in the untreated situation, there's more RPA foci or intensity of RPA in the nucleus. And then, again, exacerbated in response to hydroxyurea or CPT. And also, if one just measures native BRDU uh, to measure single-stranded DNA directly, again, there's an increase in the ETA1 deficient cells. And um, that increase is, again, um, uh, exacerbated by uh, replication stress. And I'll just point out that the increased RPA intensity here indicates that, in fact, RPA is getting to the, to the DNA, and that'll become important in the uh, future uh, experiment I'll show you. So it's at forks, and it's important. How does it work? So we uh, tagged ETA1, expressed it in cells, immunoprecipitated, and said, what does it interact with? And we saw, uh, well, of course, the RPA proteins, which is what we expected, peptides for those in two of the uh, immunoprecipitations. We also saw uh, the Bloom complex, the BTR complex, as well as the ATR-ATRIP complex itself. 
And uh, we don't usually see ATR in most immunoprecipitations of uh, other replication stress response proteins, so that intrigued us. And I'm going to tell you uh, the follow-up to that um, part of the story. So uh, we mapped an interaction domain on ETA1 for ATR. That is at the N-terminus of the protein. So if we express just the, the 250 amino acids at the N-terminus and we do an IP of those, uh, that protein, it will co-immunoprecipitate ATR. And uh, when we looked in that region, it didn't really seem to have uh, much structure to it, although we could find a small motif in it that seemed to be conserved through evolution. You see uh, in, uh, in all the vertebrates anyway, we saw this motif. And it had similarity to this top BP1 protein. And specifically, a region of that protein that's known to interact with ATR and actually act as the ATR activation domain, or the AAD. So this tryptophan in top BP1 was shown by Bill Dumphy's lab to be critical for binding and activating ATR. So if one mutates that, then this complex no longer stimulates ATR. The protein top EP1 won't bind and won't stimulate its activity. So this uh, made us think perhaps this tryptophan in ETA1 may also be important. So we mutated it to alanine and we lose a lot of the interaction with ATR just by that single amino acid change. And then we said, well, is ETA1 also capable of directly activating ATR in vitro? And the answer is yes. So, and this is just a simple kinase assay. I'll walk you through it. We take, uh, we purify ATR ATRIP complex, actually, and uh, we incubate it either with GST as a control, and you see some basal level of kinase activity. If we incubate it with the ATR activation domain of top EP1, that's that protein there, you see stimulation of the kinase activity. And if we incubate it with a fragment, an terminal fragment of ETA1, we see robust activation as well. So that's the ETA1 fragment and the robust activation. And all the controls look like we'd expect. If we mutate the tryptophan alanine, we lose the activation. A different fragment of ETA1 doesn't activate, and all this activity we're measuring is ATR dependent. If we use an ATR specific inhibitor, it all goes away. So in fact, this complex uh, in a test tube can activate ATR towards substrates. It also can do that in cells. So if we overexpress full-length ETA1, we see hyperactivation of ATR. And that's actually even uh, more dramatic if you just overexpress the N-terminal fragment of ETA1. So what I'm doing is graphing the um, expression level of ETA1, the fragment on the x-axis, and phosphorylation of gamma H2AX on, uh, of H2AX on the uh, y-axis. And you see there's a nice relationship. The more ETA1 protein we express, the more phosphorylation and signaling we observe. And that's largely abrogated again by making this tryptophan mutation. So in cells, in fact, this protein can activate. This is in the absence of any added genotoxic agent. So it can activate ATR in vitro, and in cells is that important for its function. So uh, my student noticed that, in fact, that this putative ATR activation domain of ETA1 at the N-terminus is actually encoded largely by three exons of the, of the gene. And fortunately, that tryptophan is in exon 2. And exon 1 and 3 are actually capable of splicing together and, and making a, full, uh, a protein just deleting exon 2 because they're in frame. So what my student did is just target this splice junction here to delete exon 2 creating a gene that, of ETA1 that uh, is missing that tryptophan and that exon, and it makes this uh, small, uh, smaller version of ETA1. So the protein is expressed from the endogenous locus, and we can ask, well, what is the function of that ATR activation domain in these cells? And of course, we're also using ETA1 uh, null cells as a, a comparison. And I should mention that doing that, making the exon 2 deletion protein, that protein, as one would expect, if you IP, it will still immunoprecipitate RPA because the RPA interaction motifs are encoded down here in this exon. So we looked at signaling. And um, so in this experiment, we're just treating wild-type cells, uh, the knockout cells or the exon 2 deleted cells with campithecin for four or eight hours looking at RPA phosphorylation, which is an ATR-dependent event. One sees a robust a uh, RPA phosphorylation in the wild-type cells, and it's blunted both by deleting ETA1 or in the exon 2 um, deleted cells. 
Uh, other substrates like MCM2 are much less affected, and CHEK1 phosphorylation is much less affected. And of course, I don't expect you to believe one Western blot. We've done this a lot of times in a lot of cells. Uh, and what one sees when one quantitates is that, in fact, RPA phosphorylation is always dramatically affected by uh, the ETA1 mutation that eliminates its ability to activate ATR. Whereas CHEK1 phosphorylation uh, is generally less affected. And this is true in many cell types. So this is just an siRNA experiment. So the knockouts I showed you actually were in uh, 293T, the ones I just showed. So if we knock down uh, U2S and, uh, with ETA1 um, siRNA, uh, you see that, OK, this is the wild type situation, and then the decreased phosphorylation of RPA in the knock, knock down situation. Same with HeLa cells. You see, again, less phosphorylation, HCT116 less. Every cell type we look at, there's always decreased RPA phosphorylation. And that contrasts, so that's both on serine 4.8 and serine 33, which both end up being ATR dependent. The contrast with CHEK1, which the pattern is uh, much less clear, again, uh, there actually is, is, is a slight increase, a consistent increase in CHEK1 phosphorylation uh, in U2S cells, but really no consistent pattern uh, in most situations. So we think ETA1 is much more important for RPA phosphorylation than for CHEK1 phosphorylation. We also uh, looked at replication stress uh, response phenotypes, for example, at uh, the ability to recover uh, or, or synthesize DNA in a challenge situation with CPT. One sees that uh, compared to the wild type U2S control, the ETA1 deficient cells are much less uh, capable of elongating uh, in the presence of CPT uh, by a single uh, molecule analysis. And the exon 2 deletion, just mutating uh, that ATR activation domain, also looks a lot like the, or pretty much indistinguishable from the null. We also see evidence of chromosome instability, things like micronuclei, which I won't show you, but also uh, evidence of increased sister chromatid exchanges. You see the, there's an increase by siRNA uh, knocking down ETA1, and also in our knockout cell lines both the, the knockout and, again, the exon 2, two different clones of the exon 2 deleted cells uh, look like they have increased sister chromatid exchanges. Modest increase compared to what Bloom would do, but significant. So in yeast, we already knew that there were multiple ATR activators. So uh, my group and uh, Peter Berger's group had identified DPP11 as the ortholog of top pp one in yeast, in budding yeast. And Peter's lab had also shown that DNA2 and DDC1 are both alternative activators of the ATR kinase in budding yeast. ETA1, uh, we would uh, argue, is an al also an alternative activator of the ATR kinase, although it has no similarity to these proteins whatsoever. We can't find an ETA1 protein in organisms that um, are not vertebrates, at least not by sequence conservation. We think that these pathways are distinct. The top BP1 activation pathway depends on the 911 complex. The ETA1 activation pathway, we don't believe, depends on the 911 complex. ETA1 can directly bind RPA, and this is sufficient to activate this kinase complex. We all, as I also mentioned, RPA phosphorylation seems to be much more dependent on this complex than this one. Knockdown of top EP1 actually has very modest effects at all, if at all, on RPA phosphorylation, whereas very strong effects on CHEK1. And knockdown of ETA1 has, as I show you, has very modest effects, if any, on CHEK1 phosphorylation. So they have some distinct substrates. They may be activated in distinct modes. And I'll uh, also present you just a little bit of evidence indicating that they are in separate pathways. So for example, looking at CPT sensitivity, I already showed you that ETA1 null cells are sensitive to CPT. This is a log scale. Okay. Top PP1 knockdown also causes mild sensitivity to CPT, as does RAD9 knockdown. But if you combine ETA1 deficiency with top PP1 deficiency or with RAD9, you see that these levels of sensitivity are much greater than either of the uh, single uh, uh, mutant control uh, um, cells. None of these give this quite the sensitivity of ATR deficiency or knockdown, although I would uh, just point out that these are siRNA experiments in combination with the nulls, so it's a little bit difficult to interpret. And I also point out that knockdown of top EP1 has a second effect in cells, and that is actually to arrest replication because it's essential for initiation. So I would caution a little bit when one looks at top EP1 knockdown and looks at um, these types of phenotypes, only because if you're interfering with initiation of replication, you, you are somewhat, um, well, it, you could be confusing uh, your analysis.
I'll also point out that TOPPP1, um, both Junji Chen and, and Steve Jackson's lab had also shown that TOPPP1 knockdown causes increased in, uh, increase in sister chromatid exchanges in cells. Now, they suggested that that was through a direct regulation of the bloom complex, and it was independent of its ability to regulate ATR. And I'll show you that ETA1 deficient cells, again, have increased SCEs, and the combined deficiency of TOPPP1 knockdown and ETA1 deficiency, again, is increased, suggesting, again, these are separate pathways. So um, what I told you then to summarize is ETA1 is a RPA interacting protein. It localizes to, to stalled forks where it can directly bind and activate the ATR complex. And it's particularly important for RPA phosphorylation and is important during normal replication in response to replication stress. And it's distinct from this other activating pathway, the ATR TOPP1 uh, complex. So uh, I'll finish just on time. The person uh, that primarily is responsible for this story is a student in the lab, Thomas Bass. Uh, Thomas has done all, almost all of the work I showed you on ETA1. And I didn't show you the actual NMR spectroscopy work we've done with mapping the RPA interacting with teeth, but Walter Chazen's lab helped us, helped, helped us do that. And with that, I'll be happy to answer your questions.